call the, uh, the meeting of the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District Board uh, Metro to order uh, April 27th, 2018. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Director Bosworth? Here. Director Bosworth? Here. Director Chase? Here. Director Kaufman Gomez? Present. Director Dutra? Here. Director Hagen? Here. Director Leopold? Director Lynn? Here. Director Matthews? Here. Director McPherson? Here. Director Rothwell? Here. Director Rotkin? Here. Ex officio Director Thomas? Ex officio Director McKee? Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a quorum. I'd like to announce uh, that we have Carlos Landavera here. He'll be able to speak with the Spanish language interpretation for us. Carlos, if you'd like to say a few words, please. Good morning, buenos días, directors, Carlos Landavera y yo, un sorpresa. Para las personas que prefieren español o necesiten traducción al español, voy a estar en la parte de atrás. Gracias. 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 Uh, this meeting is being televised by Community Television. Thank you very much. Santa Cruz County, Channel 26, and our technician is Mr. Lynn Denton. Um, we'll be down for uh, number, item number four, um, comments from the Board of Directors. Uh, any Board of Director comments on any items that are not on the agenda? Okay. Go to, uh, uh, well, communications to the Board of Directors. Do we have any communications to the Board of Directors that needs to be recognized? From the public. From the public? Oh, good. For items not on the agenda? Fine. Moving right along, uh, uh, written communications from MAC. Uh, is, are there any uh, written communications? Nope, no, they're not seen. Very good. Um, number, item number seven, labor organization, organization communications. Uh, any communications from labor? Good morning, Board of Directors. It is a natural lead, okay. I'd like to report to you that um, we have resolved several grievances through the informal discussions, even though some issues are still um, pending. But I'm, um, I have to tell you that um, a lot of these issues are going back again to a lack of communication and due process. Uh, we're notifying employees of changes and not being prepared with changes to policies. And, um, and we are still going through going to an arbitration on a case because stubbornness got in the way. And uh, spending lots of money on lawyer fees and soon an arbitrator manage, management has to provide due process to employees. Um, I can go back to um, going back, um, saying the same thing and repeating myself once again. We're a small agency. We need to communicate better, um, you know, so we don't um, have these pending issues. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments from labor organizations? Okay, um, is there any additional uh, documentation to support uh, any of the existing agenda items? Did you have item items? nine. Uh, nine. That, uh, um, attachment we have uh, an attachment. Um, Rick Longinotti's um, March 28th letter, in which he presented to the board at the uh, March 23rd meeting, uh, was left out of the packet. As a result, uh, it's uh, page A nine O A eight has been added today. Okay. Um, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, any board member or member of the public have uh, questions on any of the items on the, the six items on the consent agenda? Yes, uh, uh, not Director really Matthews. specifically, but I don't know where else to put it. Um, I see Larry Taylor and audience, and I'm wondering if somewhere here we could get a report on the um, UCSC fee increase. Um, I know there's a MAC um, UCSC representative. I don't know where else to put that, but maybe if we could just have an update on that. Did you, um, yeah, we probably have to do that next. Uh, well, it'll be no, we just take a report. Just add us a report. Just a status report. Just a status report. Is Maybe Alex, you could fold that into your report. Yeah, I can. I can. Yeah, you'll have an updated yeah. report. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Good. Thank but you. But it's pending and it's a big deal. Very Stay good. Tuned, Larry. Very good. 
Any other um, <laughs> board member have some comments on the consent agenda? Any member of the audience? Move approval of the consent agenda. Second. And moved and seconded for the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Approved unanimously. Uh, now we have a couple of presentations for employee longevity awards for Noah Vassier. Is Noah here? Yeah. Oh, come on up. Yeah, come on up. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Hello. Come on. Come on. Yeah, we're going to have the board yes, member present you with a uh, proclamation here in a moment. But go ahead, have your say. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure working for Paracruz the past 10 years, knowing that uh, I've helped my community, knowing that a lot of the people that I drive wouldn't make it out if I weren't there to pick them up. Sometimes I'm the only person that they see the whole week. So knowing that I can help people live their life with dignity that everybody deserves is a very rewarding experience. Like a, Dr. Seuss says, it's the world you may be one person, but to one person you may be the world. So thank you very much. Thank you. 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 you. Uh, do you, or do you have it? Yeah. No, no, it's the black one with Thank the pen. Thank you very much. The yes, we were. Yeah, we might mention. That's not. That's not. That's not. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll get to you, but uh, <laughs> who's, who's, you know, I, I want to say uh, how many. Um, Very good. How many guns on it? It's in the mail. Yeah, it's in the yeah. The, the, the proclamation's in the mail. I'd like to just uh, ask: uh, Is it seventy or eighty thousand um, trips we have for Paracruise a year? How much is that? Is that seventy-five thousand? Seventy-five thousand plus. Yeah, that's uh, it's a tremendous service that we provide. Uh, directly, would you like to say yes? No, I have been one of the. Put the mic right. It's on. Yeah. I have been one of the lucky ones that Noah has come to take uh, and get me where I needed to go because some of the places are, uh, it's, it's rather difficult for me to get to. And I really do want to thank you, Noah, for the many times you have come to my house to pick me up and take me where I needed to go. My yeah, thank you, Noah. Thank you, thank you for your whole one, team as well. I'm one of the ones that he is He's Open the world to me. Thanks. Very good. Very good. Okay. There we. Okay. We will go to item number eleven. Uh, but we have another employee retirement. But uh, Russell Thomas is not here. Is that correct? I don't think he's not here. Okay. So we'll we want to thank him for his years of service as well. Um, number item number twelve. The CEO oral report. Uh, Mr. Clifford. Okay. Why don't I start off with uh, the UCSC fee increase, and if I could ask Hilary if he'd step up to the mic and just let us know how that's going, and then I have a couple other item items I'd like to cover. So I'll, I'll keep this brief. The uh, fee measure is on the ballot. Uh, voting will take place May 13th through, no, excuse me, 17th through the 23rd. Uh, we've got a terrifically energized group of student leaders that are, again, Outreach yesterday via, uh, I saw it on uh, social media, on Facebook, also in the Quarry Plaza. And I brought this along to show you uh, t-shirts that they'll be wearing. Um, this is very much what we'll be using as much of our campaign measure. Uh, a version of this with the slug without the sign are being installed on the articulated buses tomorrow, right? Absolutely not. So those will be in service through the campus for the rest of the quarter. And uh, I think that's... Can people buy those t-shirts? Um, Mike, we didn't make enough of them. These are more for the students who are actually doing the campaign. And I think we've only got a few dozen of these. Okay. But 
and I don't know, there's only a few of the right extra large size that you and I might want. So. <laughs> 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 be an that's okay. You give the students yeah. that are out there doing the work. That's where they're Yeah, work. there will be uh, pins, stickers, and other kinds of things like this that are going to be distributed. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Where, where, can, where can people get stickers, like to pass out to students? And stuff? Uh, they're going to be distributed by the folks who are tabling, both in Quarry Plaza, out at the dining halls. We hope to do some pop-up events at bus stops. Great. So we'll be out and about and look for the t-shirts and those folks will probably have materials. Thank you. Is Christy your main contact? Yes, Christy okay. Johnston okay. is leading this. Thank you. Thanks, Lloyd. Thanks. Uh, and before I go on, and I, you know, we have Noah. Noah, can you show the plaque? That we'll we gave you right <laughs> right <laughs> right 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 Yeah, yeah, I think that would be great. Let's take yeah. a second. Uh, no, come on up here. Get in front of the TV, cameras, you've got it all going. This is the real deal here. I got cameras. Is that? It's a TV camera behind it. No, Okay, we can we can move on our feet and fix things real quick. Thank you. We should spend the whole morning just celebrating Noah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Moving on to a couple of other items. Uh, as you all are aware, I believe you received an email from Gina recently about the university's conference, and we'll keep reminding you about that between now and then. Uh, conference running from June 23rd through the 26th. Um, we'd like to encourage you, if you have time, to participate in the reception, and we'll keep you posted on timing and, and location of all of that, and the open session, uh, opening session. And then uh, I think uh, Donna Lind has committed to being there to uh, help us with the opening session as a representative of uh, Scotts Valley, so we appreciate that. And uh, next, I'd like to just show you the PSA. Is that way to go, Gina? This is something that Barrow has been working on and it will show up on various channels, Comcast channels. It's only 15 seconds, so. Okay, Don't blink. Okay. Isaac. Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> you got better known as IT. It worked earlier, we tested it. Go up to the playback, Jane. That's a technical term. Playback? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And go play. Santa Cruz Metro is proud to add two new trips during the morning commute of the Highway 17 Express service. One to San Jose and one to Santa Cruz. So get out of your car, read, relax, and work on the bus. For more information and to take our survey, visit scmtd.com. One more time? Sure. Yeah. Since now I know how to do it. <laughs> now you're just showing up. Yeah. Santa Cruz Metro is proud to add two new trips during the morning commute of the Highway 17 Express service, one to San Jose and one to Santa Cruz. So get out of your car, read, relax, and work on the bus. For more information and to take our survey, visit scmtd.com. Voila. All right, very good. Okay, just a couple of other quick uh, updates. Uh, statewide on uh, legislation, we are closely tracking AB 3124, which is Bloom. It's moving through committees. That is a bill that will make it legal legal to have three position bike racks on 60-foot buses. That's important to properties across the state who want to have bike racks on their articulated buses and certainly important to us with our, our pilot project. So in order to stay compliant, we've only been able to put, uh, compliant with the current law, we've only been able to put two positions on those 60-footers. Um, SCA 6, um, Wiener is in suspension right now. That's one that would allow uh, special taxes by a vote of 55% uh, if 100% of the money goes to transportation. Um, 
transportation programs and projects. Unfortunately, that's in suspense, but uh, we'll see what happens with that. And then SB 1434 Lieva, I think if I'm pronouncing that right, is a CTA-sponsored bill that would um, uh, direct the CPUC to establish new rates for transportation properties that are using electricity for uh, propulsion. So we're, we're trying through the CTA to try to mitigate down the rates as we move into increasingly into an environment in which uh, um, electric buses will be mandated. And then two federal issues that have sort of popped into the discussion, nothing in writing yet, um, but they popped into the discussion since our team returned from Washington, and that is that there is talk about a so-called rescission bill. So you might remember that there was all of this uh, great enthusiasm about what they called plussing up some of the FAST Act monies. We were getting some additional up $200,000 in additional uh, formula money and some additional money for us to compete against. Uh, you might recall that when the omnibus bill was presented to uh, uh, the president, uh, that actually the day before he said, I'm going to veto it. The day of, he signed it, but he says, uh, don't ever bring something like this to me again. And uh, I guess the Republicans have kind of taken heart to that and have now been talking at least about this notion of a rescission bill in which they would attempt to rescind all of those nice little plus-ups that occurred. So let's hope that never makes it onto paper, but I just want you to be aware that that's happening. And then also additional talk that has surfaced in the last week about the next reauthorization, the FAST Act, is to be reauthored in about two years. There's some discussion about tacking on an additional two years to that and postponing the next reauthorization out yet further. That could be good, that could be bad, we'll see what happens. I think what they're struggling with at a federal level right now is the fact that today, now, they need to be talking about the next reauthorization to get ready to figure out how to fund it, and I think they're just not ready to have that conversation. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, that uh, com concludes my presentation. Okay. Now, that was, uh, was that 12 and 13 then? Uh, you, you it want to go through? Just, no, that's where no, I was. You guys get to talk about the PC. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's my segue into that. That segue into the, your trip to uh, Washington, D.C.? And that's I, the, I'll start with that. Okay. Director Ron. So, uh, we took a, uh, a trip to Washington, D.C. to lobby for basically for more transit money for our local transit district as well as for transit in the country as a whole. Uh, Ed went and Jimmy uh, and myself and, and Alex. And um, these trips are interesting because you had people, we talked to people in Congress, in, the, in the, uh, both the Senate uh, and the House, or their staff. The, we went at a period when the Congress was not in session, so we ended up talking to staff people. That's not always a bad thing. You think, well, we, let's talk to the top person or something. But the staff people who are in charge of transit for that uh, member of Congress often know more about the issues and are the people who actually are the ones putting together the, the uh, position for the, for the uh, actual legislator. And, so it's not a wasted trip to talk to those people. And we had very good conversations with those folks. Um, I, I would summarize the situation in terms of transit funding nationally just by saying everybody said the gas tax is not working. It's not the way to go to the future. We have to have an alternative to it. And everybody said we're not ready for the alternative to it. And I think that was that there's not an exception to that, that situation. So people are talking about miles traveled or something that comes with the, when, you, when you buy the vehicle as part of the sales cost of it as a tax on top of it then or something. But nobody's ready to actually make that happen. Oregon's gone further than others in trying to put this together, but they're, they're not ready to do it uh, at the level of that state. And California's talking about it, but it's just not happening. So it, it's um, at least people were rational. It's, you, you don't know what you're going to get when you go to D.C. People were rational. They had a sense of what the problems were what have to be addressed, but they weren't quite ready to do it. Everybody realizes they have to start talking about the reauthorization that uh, Alex Clifford just talked about, but nobody yet, no, again, what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, nobody's really there. We, it was hard to lobby at that level. But the other thing you're doing when you talk, go to Washington is to try and get, uh, particularly from our local California, lo local uh, legislators, but all, even the legislators throughout California, to get them to become aware of this district and its needs. So when we went to talk to legislators, uh, Jimmy would typically start off explaining our district, where we are, what our issues are, and our problems. 
we definitely made the major message that our problem is we have to replace something between 60 and 62 buses. Now, and now it's 59 and 61 or whatever, but something like 60 new buses. And we explained that we're a district that has pretty, we're doing pretty well as far as our resources compared to most districts around the country. We have a half cent sales tax from 1978, or most of the half cent sales tax from 78, plus we've got measure D money coming in, we're doing self-help work, and yet we're in desperate trouble. I mean, you have 60, 60 out of 100 buses need to be replaced, and the buses are, some of them, uh, way past the 14-year lifetime that they're supposed to you know, be replaced at, for the, or the 12-year thing that actually is a rational life for a bus, but the 14 that Congress mandated. We're, our buses are way beyond that, causing problems, and we talked about the bus fires we had last year. So as if a district like ours is in trouble, transit is in trouble in the United States. So that was our message when we went and talked to people. Um, the, uh, we talked to people in the administration as well, the FTA and the Department of Transportation. The only thing that people will add to my, my comments here, but the one interesting and useful meeting that we had there was with the Secretary of, not Secretary, but the uh, Administrator for the Federal Transit Administration. And uh, Alex very gently and politely made the comments. says, uh, you know, we'd like, when the president or the administration is talking about transportation, we'd like to see some mention of transit and buses. And the, the administrator just jumped on it. It's like, you know, it, we like in, the, in the legislation and in the discussions, we'd like to see more discussion of transit and buses. It's in there! Just, it's like, it was like a shock because he hadn't been like, you know, uh, you know, nasty or like pressing hard or something. It was just a kind of a last minute throwaway comment as we finished our presentation about our needs. So that was kind of a shock, and so we, you know, quickly backpedaling, trying to explain what, you know, we're not trying to like cause a fight here or make something happen. What useful came out of that meeting was um, their willingness to be flexible, and that's the term they use, when it comes to how we apply money we got for an over-the-hill electric bus. That, as most of you know, that electric bus that we, the model we tried didn't work very well. It didn't, didn't have the sufficient power to keep up with traffic. and. Uh, so it, it really wasn't meeting the specifications that we had bid, and, and so we're not sure we're ready to get an electric bus. And we said, well, what, well we got this award, this grant, for, for these buses over the hill, and could, could we possibly change those back into um, uh, CNG or even uh, clean diesel buses? And so they said, well, they read us the legislation. They said, the, the legislation says that the buses have to be um, they're supposed to be for zero emission vehicles, but they're, they're willing to have them be for ones that are better than the, you know, a certain percentage better than the average performance of buses in the United States. And the question we have, we don't know the answer to it yet, I don't think, is are the buses that, if we buy one of these clean diesel buses in California that meet car requirements, the clean air uh, at, uh, buses in California, would those meet the specifications to actually transfer the funds? If we're not ready to buy an electric bus, could we transfer those funds over and buy one of these clean diesel buses? And the answer was, we'll be flexible about it. We need to know it has to meet the requirements of the act. It has to be, if everybody in the United States buying a clean diesel bus has the same diesel bus, then no, we're not gonna give you money for that. But if, the, if meeting the California specifications means the buses we would buy would be better than the average bus in the United States that's been now being produced, they would be willing to seriously consider transferring the funds over. So that was very concrete information we got in that from people at the very top that would be making these decisions. And it was from everybody there, the people who are the career employees that are sort of making the real decisions here, as well as the, the uh, uh, Trump's appointment to the position that uh, was making the talk to us. So I think it was a productive visit for us. I think we've got a good sense of what's going on. We're definitely on the agenda of a lot of Congress members and senators. Uh, the ones from California, in terms of the stuff that we need to be able to make sure the transit gets funded. And it's going to be a bit of a fight because this, the current administration has not made transit an important part of their infrastructure considerations. Thank you very, thank you very much. Did, uh, any other comments, uh, Jimmy Dutra or Ed? Well, thank you, um, Mike, for that description of our trip. Uh, you know, these trips are really they're really impactful because over the last two years, we've been able to bring home over five, about $5 million worth of resources to start replacing, replacing our aging fleet. And as many people know, we've had incidents of you know, our buses burning. And um, these, are, these are just issues that we've tried to take to our federal government and bring back um, 
full, you know, the resources that we're able to do. We've been very successful over the last two years. We've been um, able to, to bring, grant, bring back grants that are going to be really helpful towards us and, and um, towards you know, replacing the buses that we need to. And as Mike said, you know, we had a lot of um, really deep conversations about the future of uh, the funding for, for Metro and for um, the programs that um, we have been so accustomed to receiving the funds and um, with an administration who is not the kindest towards transportation. So seeing Alex get um, yelled at by, by the Trump administration was kind of funny. <laughs> we enjoyed it. <laughs> I never thought I'd see that. Um, but, but what he was saying was, was true because we definitely you know, have a president who probably has never um, ridden public transportation, and so he doesn't really have the um, desire to put it, um, the funding in there for it. So to have us there and the voices, um, to have our voices on Capitol Hill, it, uh, you know, really advocating to um, you know the, our representatives and to the administration is important because you know we are a, a small district and we're impacted and we're you know we just went through a very um, you know difficult time. Um, trying to come out of a fiscal deficit, and um, unfortunately, things like capital projects and our buses were put on the, on the side um, sidelines, and those are things that we're going to have to start addressing, and um, for many for many reasons. And I, and I do have to say, you know, this this trip was very it, we there was a lot came out of it, and one of the biggest things that we're going to hopefully come out of it is. The fact that you know our electric buses are just not performing to standards over um, Highway 17, and if we're going to be able to use those funds to um, in other areas to replace um, you know maybe some other buses or, or look into other types of um, modes of transportation for um, clean energy for our buses to get over the hills, then that's going to be a big plus. And that was a, um, a really good conversation we did have with you know um, the, the, um, the administration part of, of our, our trip. So, but. Everybody's kind of on the same page, Republicans and Democrats, when we talk about, um, you know, uh, tax questions. When we talk about uh, taxing and how are we going to move forward in, in getting the funding for this, and and people are really hesitant to tax the people um, any further in, in their communities on, on both sides, and uh, we and and I think we do see, we did hear a consensus that people do want to see a fair share of um, of people paying their fair share. So um, you know, a lot of people have been, um, you know, have cars that are economically friendly, and um, some other in versus uh, you know people who just have regular gas-driven cars. But everyone drives on the road, and everyone has an impact on the road. So um, you know, people on both sides of the aisle um, believe that we need to figure out what we're going to do in our next steps to um, you know start getting the funding because we just can't always keep on increasing the gas tax. So, but with that said, you know, I always, I look forward to these trips. I am always extremely exhausted when we're finished. It's um, really a runaround from the beginning of the day to the very end. It's, it's nonstop and we do it for, um, we, we, it's from the moment we hit the ground, we're, we're having meetings and uh, we're meeting with people and we're really making good time out of, you know, our, our visit to, 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 to DC and, and I'm looking forward to these um, grants that we'll be cons we'll be doing this year, and hopefully we'll have some good news about you know what we can do with the funding um, that we currently have for the the um, three million dollar grant. And um, yeah, so Ed, anything else? Yeah, real quick. I don't need to repeat what both of you have said. Uh, this is my first trip. I uh, went in replacement of Director McPherson, and obviously my clout wasn't as good as his to schedule a bunch <laughs> of uh, high level meetings. But uh, I'm sure he'll make it back next year. Um, you, the, my takeaway from this trip was is that uh, you know our, our CEO really presented himself well to the agencies we met with, and he was uh, respected in those agencies, and that reflected good on us. And I think our team made a good presentation about our needs. Uh, like Jimmy said, you know a lot of the, the the influence of what's going on in DC right now is unstable, so nobody knows where we're going. But I think the one takeaway I have is, is that uh, when we expressed our concern about the unwillingness to spend the grants on the electric buses because the technology is not where it's at, I think they appreciated that we weren't being frivolous and we really wanted to make a good decision. And uh, I think that's just a good reflection on, on us and uh, gives us credibility. So thanks for the trip.
Yeah, I might just, of not being on this trip uh, as I have been before, but I want to say from last year's uh, uh, trip that uh, really helped a lot is to see the actions that this district is taking, um, being uh, lean on its budget but maintain them, uh, the unions foregoing some of the, uh, the wage increases to maintain uh, as much many buses and employees as we can, our efforts in passing Measure D, all that combination, it's, it registered with them. You guys are doing something to try to help yourself and we're more uh, apt to help you. So I want to thank everybody who was involved over these recent years into uh, at least a, a, allowing us, we've had to consolidate some things, but for allowing us to maintain our service and for the voters who passed Measure D, uh, it was, uh, that was really significant. And I, I, I know it registered with those folks back in DC and it has in uh, state capital as well. So uh, that's, uh, Good, good report, and uh, we'll keep moving onward and upward. Yes, sir. So uh, Mike was talking about clean diesel. Um, what is that? It sounds like an oxymoron. No, no, no <laughs> I hadn't heard the, heard the term clean coal, which doesn't really exist. Right. Um, clean, clean diesel, they actually are buses now that are way cleaner than actual CNG buses and that meet car requirements in California. They're more expensive than the ones we've had. It wouldn't be our first choice. We'd like to move to electric. That's where we're going. We're mandated to do that in California by 2040. But in the meantime, as an interim, if you're trying to sort of make sure you keep service on the road as you buy electric buses and have to fill in some either CNG or clean diesel buses. So we, we probably will end up doing that. Um, and the issue comes down to literally which, which is a cleaner bus, the CNG bus or the clean diesel. And if they just re re rebuilt them and changed the way that they operate. They're not zero emission, mm -hmm. that's for sure. So they're not competing with electric, but they are competing with CNG. And more to the point, um, they do meet the carbon requirements in California, which are very strict requirements. And the diesel buses we have now do not. You know, yeah. So it's a very different bus. Uh, what's the difference in cost between uh, the natural gas and that. Sure. So here. Officer. Basically, the cost difference is about 700000 per bus. And uh, there's a lot of what they call after treatment. Which, no, which, in which so the new one is 700000 right. It's 700000 versus 550 or 60. Yeah, there's more well, differences. Well, it's yeah. 575 for CNG, and you're looking at about 700000 Oh, yeah. Because okay, the difference is not a difference. Yeah, yeah they're going to cost a million four. $700,000 difference. Uh -huh. <laughs> My eyebrows as well. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, um, yeah, they use a lot of after uh, treatment processes like uh, urethia, ammonia, injection, and such to uh, burn the after uh, exhaust. And uh, they actually just run a lot cleaner. The certification, um, basically, uh, compared to a CNG, you're looking at about uh, a much less output of uh, carbon monoxide from a diesel than we are from a, a CNG bus. And basically, it's because of the heat factor that uh, compressed natural gas has, uh, it's less than diesel, so you have to use more compressed natural gas in order to get the power that you would get out of the equivalent amount of diesel. What about particulates? Particulates are down almost to, uh, to nothing, really. Uh, I brought with me a little chart here. So you've got two testing processes. One is the uh, federal testing program, and the other one is a supplemental emissions testing process. And basically the federal one is a lot linear, um, lenient, more lenient than the, uh, the supplemental. And for the NOx ratings on a certified diesel versus a certified CNG, uh, CNG is set at around 0 0.03 and diesel is 0 0.07. Where it starts getting a little more uh, significant is that your uh, carbon monoxide, it's uh, for a certified CNG is 6.4 versus uh, 0.6. So your emissions for particulates is much less on a diesel map than it was in the past, and it's much less than what a certified CNG engine is. We've already spoken to uh, the Air Resource Board in California, and they pretty much uh, indicated to us that. We're good to go if we want to go uh, a clean diesel route also. 
there's also technology that in the new phase, which probably will be what we purchase, the diesel engine that's coming out is even cleaner than the one they have now. I'm trying to get a lot more information associated with that particular engine type, um, but the regulations that California has are much stricter than the rest of the nation. So in essence, we are paying more for the diesel engines that we put in, into uh, performance here in California than anyone else in the other uh, 49 states. So that in and of itself puts us aside or in a different category than all the others. Yeah, if you have uh, one sheet of paper of that, I'd like to see that, or I think it'd be good for each director to get it, and uh, somehow let us, well, if we, when we get into this purchase of these new diesels, if that should happen, we're going to need it. I think it would be very good for us to have it as part of the explanation of what we're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I do caution you, there's a lot of acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you'll kind of have to filter. Maybe, it. maybe just give it a cover, okay. uh, just a yeah. 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 basic, yeah. 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 Okay, all right. And Include I, a glossary. I put together just uh, a... <laughs> Wow. But anyway, I'll put a glossary in there so you, you have the uh, acronym definitions. Okay. Director Kaufman Gomez? I don't think I want to touch it again. Yeah. <laughs> Was that you? I don't know. We, 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 we all turned those off. So yeah. that one. Nope. Uh, turn it off. So it's it's turn yours. It off. Maybe it's bad like, I can scream. How's that sound? Yeah. 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 It's it won't be picked up on that. What is the difference in maintenance costs between the, uh, we have a CNG, if, we, if we're going to go with the clean diesel versus an electric bus? Because even though we buy the, the merchandise and we have that piece of equipment here, what are we doing with, uh, what do we know about the cost factor of maintenance? Well, with the after treatment, there's a little bit more of a cost because you have to replenish certain gases, certain liquids and such that uh, treat the, uh, the emissions. But, from a uh, long-term perspective, diesels, on average, will run you about 500,000 miles between you and between overhauls. Whereas your CNGs are running us maybe 120, 140,000 miles. They run much hotter. They're more, uh, they're equivalent to a gasoline engine. They've got spark plugs, they've got coils, they've got, so they run hotter, because they run leaner. And as a result, that's how they get the emissions down. The diesel engine basically is more of a, uh, the air gets compressed very, very highly, and that's your ignition point. Uh, diesel is then sprayed in, we've reached almost top level of compression, and that's what ignites, right? So it's a much more thoroughly burning uh, type of uh, engine. The uh, issue is that it, it runs less hotter than a compressed natural gas engine. So you get more longevity out of it, basically. So you're looking at you're looking at two overhauls versus one uh, within the same time frame, approximately. So half the when, when the district made its decision to move to CNG, there there's no question that the CNG buses produce less um, uh, greenhouse gases and way less particulate matter than the diesels did. And that's just technology's changed, and now that's not true. And the, we're, we are actually, uh, our buses from pre-1978 buses that we're running, the Gillings are, uh, the diesel buses are doing much better than the CNG buses we, we've been buying as far as maintenance issues go. I mean, that's just in terms, for the reasons you just said, they run 125,000 miles where they have to be you know, fixed up uh, versus, you know, it's going to go 300,000. It makes quite a bit of difference in terms of the maintenance cost. So, it, at the time we made the decision, it was the right decision given the technology we had in front of us. Looking back on it now, we would have been better off probably to just stuck with diesel and wait to, to move to electric and skip the CNG phase. Everybody at the time thought CNG is obviously going to be better than diesel and working in the right direction, and it turns out not to be the case. But no, nobody could have possibly known that. Uh, Director? Yes, go ahead. You know, Talk about these electric buses. I had a discussion with Alex this week. This thing to my right, I have a battery in there that's over $780. That's a new, a great new battery for wheelchairs. The only problem is it's supposed to last five and a half years. This thing's dead. That's only two years old. 
Why? Because I use it more. I read one article that they said that the average battery for wheelchairs is new. It's supposed to have an average five years. But I had a footnote down there I'm, that many of the people who use these chairs are dead before five years. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, I don't want to be part of that aspect of it. Right, you said it, But realistically, <laughs> which is dead, the battery or you. No, but realistically, this thing, and I talked with him, is the same problem that he and the administration is facing with the electric buses. My use of this thing is comparable to 17. I get faster, flat, in town uh, than I ever did before. And it goes longer while I use it. But I charge it every night already, just coming up from here, down to Watsonville 5 this morning. And from uh, Metro Center to here, I've already lost a quarter of my strength of this battery. That means I, if I go home the same way, I'm below half of the length of the charge of this battery. I can only imagine the thought of a 17 bus with the batteries we have now getting over there, having this charge to get back. Okay, what happens when you get over there with one of those things and it's late in the afternoon? You have to have somebody in a car to go over and get that uh, driver because you can leave the bus there. But the, cost in the situation with these electric buses until the technology arrives where we can use them for the main situation of the 17 runs. It's senseless. It really is senseless. But Elon Musk is going to save us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Our CEO is going to save us in this situation. Oh, oh, good pressure, Alex. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Any, uh, yeah, uh, any other comments on the DC? No. I, I, I might just, um, as a spinoff, uh, not speaking of DC and not advocating per se, but there's, uh, we have an election here in the state too, and there's one issue that's related to transportation that's important to us. I'm not advocating for it, but I just want, it's Prop 69, mm -hmm. that in essence would, uh, if it is passed with the yes vote, it would mean that transportation funds that are allocated to transportation would stay there which uh, the state has a habit of robbing from it. Uh, I think some people are confused about it, and that's why I just like to say, if you want transportation dollars to stay for transportation, uh, a yes vote, uh, maybe, but that's, well, do what you will. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you you but can for transportation, people, you can't spend any transit district money yeah. to support it. Yeah. You can say what you believe I want to be careful it. about it, I'll put it that way. But uh, for transportation pur purposes, a, a, a yes vote is uh, a very, uh, very good vote for it. Just because uh, I think there is some confusion out with the general public on that. But that's that's a state ballot measure on the, in the June ballot. And people will start voting before we meet again, I think. So, uh, okay, we will, uh, is that uh, what you need for, ready to go to 14? Uh, to receive an update and provide the CEO direction on California Air Resources, California Air Resources sources Board, CARB, uh, Post zero emissions regulation. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the last discussion was a really good segue into this topic, and you explored some parts of it that we did not include in this report. Um, going back to the administrator, uh, by the way, the administrator was acting administrator, and fortunately, her permanent replacement has been named since we returned. Oh. So, <laughs> so I might be back You're on no the same You're not going to be able to have you never know. Yeah, right. so, so if you're on her enemies list, it doesn't matter anymore. So That's right. Well, remember who appoints the new one, too. So. Yeah. All right. Well, moving on to this item. So this item, uh, I know, is a heavy item, and every once in a while I have to bring you a really heavy, lofty item, and this is, this is one of those. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to read the item and get caught up on what's been going on. And, of course, I've been keeping you informed ever since, ever since the ICT um, Integrated Clean Transportation Initiative was... Pro, uh, proposed in draft back in December, and I had to initially respond, and then in January inform the board about what that was, what was going on there, and what the initial response was. Uh, since then, and actually prior to that, uh, I, I've been an active member of the uh, California Transportation Association Electrification Committee, 
which is dealing with this uh, proposed initiative, ICT, and trying to come up with ways to make it more acceptable to us in the industry, transportation industry across the state. And so throughout this report, I've brought you up to speed on the ICT. I've, I've given you uh, uh, the current status of those discussions and proposed changes that CTA is, uh, is hoping to put forth. Um, it is a fast-moving target. These meetings keep popping up very spontaneously. Lately, I've had to make some trips to Sacramento, uh, as I will have to do again now this next Friday, because we now have a meeting with CARB to talk about the pr potential proposal from CTA. So um, we're trying to do everything we can before the board actually um, puts forth a regulation which is anticipated to be as soon as possibly June. Um, so a lot of work between now and June needs to be done. Um, so what I would do is, is, in assuming that you were able to get through all of that stuff that I provided you, I would turn you now to page 14.5. And if we can, if we can focus on those four bullet points, which are really the direction that I seek from you today. Um, one, of course, is that, that you concur that I should continue to participate in the CTA Electrification Committee and, and represent us, and, and, um, and two, uh, tangential to that, that you understand the differences that we're proposing through the counterproposal of the CTA, and that you see that those are consistent with where we would like to go, that is not rushing into this technology, giving us a little bit more time, not arguing about the 2040 deadline. We, we've, we've agreed with CARB, 2040, fine. Uh, it's really about the steps in between, how you get there. And it's about whether the technology is ready today or will become increasingly ready as we go through the years. Um, you know, as, as Norm talked about, what he experiences on his wheelchair is, is what is being experienced with the transit properties that are using uh, uh, electric buses under pilot projects today. Um, those buses, you can spend a, a lot of money and you can build infrastructure to charge those buses throughout the day, uh, which is not the way we've been proposing to run our system. We'd like to run our system, charge overnight, and run all day. Uh, but the technology is not there yet. Um, the industry thinks it will get there, and I would propose that we take advantage of sort of slowing our pace down just a little bit. And if the first threshold at which you have to start buying, say, 25% electric buses is until 23. At this point, what I'm proposing is that we uh, possibly wait that long before we place our next order. As you know, we already have a grant. As, as Jimmy is, is excruciatingly aware, we've had a grant to buy an electric bus uh, to run as a circulator in Watsonville. Um, and that's been two years. And we still don't have it. And we won't have that probably until next year sometime. Um, it takes a while to get these buses, and we need to get them here. Um, we haven't been rushing because we need to sort out the specification, we need to sort out the infrastructure to charge them, uh, and then we need to get them here and we need to try them out. And so right now we're ready on the verge of placing that order. Um, Ciro and, and Eddie and Aaron are going to go down to LA and meet with uh, Proterra this next week and try to finalize the specification so that we can place that order. Um, and then they'll also be able to come back and have a better understanding of when those four buses will be here. We need to get them here. We need to get that electrical infrastructure in place before they get here. And then we need to have some time to operate them and see how they do in, in our particular area. Um, what we do know from the experiences of Foothill and from San Joaquin and now from VTA is that on an overnight charge in an operating environment, they're probably going in the range of 120 to 150 miles before needing to re be recharged. We have runs as high as 300 miles. And again, we would like buses that we can charge all night, run all day, and run all day on any one of our routes. Mm -hmm. But the product is not ready to go yet for that. So we need some time. And, and what it, CTA is working on is consistent with that philosophy, trying to slow things down a little bit for when that first threshold hits. Uh, and then the next threshold after that. Um, we would have a short-term obligation to provide a plan to CARB on how we would get to fully electric by 20, the, the 2030 milestone and the 2040 100%. Um, we already have a plan. We, so once the regulation is adopted, we would bring that plan back to you and have it 
revised and updated and then resubmit that to CARP. So we're, we're part of the way there. We're, we're one of the few agencies that has adopted a plan mapping out how we get to fully electric buses by 2040. So again, uh, going back to these four bullet points, um, uh, endorsing the uh, proposal that um, um, as far as ZEB grant applications that we not apply for any more zero emission bus applications in the short run, get our buses in. Um, now that four could become 10, it's just to make matters complicated. We talked about the, the LONO grant that we have, the, the $2.8 million grant to buy three over the road coaches. Uh, the board members talked about our discussion in Washington, D.C. And we talked about really two proposals. One, and the proposal we really would like to do is to be able to convert those three uh, zero emission over the road coaches into uh, low emissions CARB certified diesel over the road coaches. That's our goal. Um, FTA sort of bristled a little bit about that, but then they came back and they said, well, let's look at it. If you can provide us data showing that what is produced and sold in California is cleaner than what is sold in the rest of the nation, we'll consider that because that is consistent with the low-no program. Zero has gotten the information on that. It appears that that is the case. We'll, we'll get the hard copies of that. We'll put together a proposal, send it to the FTA and see what they say. As a fallback, the fallback is that if they say no, they broach the idea that maybe what we can do is look at uh, flipping that from zero emission over the road coaches to zero emission fixed route buses. Mm -hmm. So if we did that, we could probably buy more than three buses and, uh, and that may take our number from four up to 10 or somewhere closer to that. So it's a little bit of a moving target there, but, but it's important that you know all of that because if coming out of today's meeting you say, uh, no, we don't, we don't wanna go back to diesel at all at this agency, that gives me direction that I don't go with plan one, I go with plan two at the FTA, and, and I don't look at other ways of getting low emission diesels to run on Highway 17. I would encourage you to consider the low emission diesels for Highway 17. The diesel buses are far more powerful. Um, you know, when we, when we submitted the LONO grant a couple of years back, uh, the first uh, bus, BYD, over the road coach, had not been manufactured at that time. And so we were going off of their specifications and what they represented verbally that their bus could do, and it just didn't do it. And it finally came in, it just didn't do it. Will it do it? Somewhere down the line, it probably will. And in 2020, MCI says they'll be producing electric buses, so there'll be more competition uh, over the road coaches. There'll be more competition. But for now, we have a need to try to, to produce a better product, one that can help us market Highway 17 in a better way, and to pull that mountain with, with more power, and diesels, quite frankly, do it. Um, diesels, as t was discussed earlier, are CARB certified, they, they're CARB compliant, and you can continue um, through, through the adoption of the 100% in 2040, CARB understands and agrees you can still buy CARB certified diesels. Going back to the point that Mike made about what this agency signed up for back in 2000, 2001, he's absolutely right, but that, that expired in 2050. And we've got it in writing from CARB that we're no longer under that mandate that we, um, we, we chose one, one of two paths back then. We chose the clean fuel path. We're no longer under that. It expired in 2015. So CARB has said, if we want to buy low emissions, CARB certified uh, diesel engines, we can do that. So we have that in writing from them. And it's consistent even with the policy that they're putting forward uh, under the ICT. So what I would, by all of that, again, your decision on diesel is an important one because the final bullet point here is that going forward, starting here in, in a month, actually, actually starting now, they just announced the next round of low no uh, grants are being accepted, uh, applications are being accepted. Um, we would apply for low emission diesel uh, over the road coaches through that program and not uh, electric buses. So, Complicated puzzle here, um, but we, the, all of this program and what I'm proposing is driven by whether you concur that we'll, you'll allow diesels back into this agency. And that's, I really want to underscore that. I don't want to hide it. Uh, I want to be completely transparent. You have not purchased any diesel buses since 1998. So that's a significant move. 
Okay. Uh, Director Matthews. Well, you have prepared us on this issue at previous meetings, so and I'm. You should like to take the You prepared us for this issue coming at us in past meetings, and um, I'm fully supportive of what you're suggesting here. I'll go ahead and make a motion that we uh, adopt this uh, recommendation. If others want to, um, oh, I guess maybe you want to have. We can start with the motion. Could. And then talk to uh, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to put the motion on the floor. I have a couple of questions as well. Okay. I'll second that motion. Okay. Um, my first question is, uh, is CARB the final um, arbiter of the um, uh, standards? Is that where it stops? Or does the legislature weigh in? I'm, I'm trying to get at That's my understanding. And, and um, because of that, we've also been working through CTA to sponsor some legislation um, that, that may or may not have a chance of passing, but it's, it's used to try to help CARB understand uh, if we really don't like the final product, we, we will go the legislative route to try to change what their final regulation is. And following on that line, I, I have to assume that you've kept our state elections informed on this issue or not? I mean. Is it worthwhile, Monty um, and uh, Stone, for them to have an awareness of this? And call your own. Yes. Oh. Excuse me. Yes. <laughs> um, we need to do a lot of legwork in that respect. Uh, CTA has, has been real good about communicating that information, but I need to do that. But it's different when we do it. Yes. And, and as you mentioned, Jimmy does it with Anna and you know, so forth. Um, can, can I interrupt? I, yeah. I think it would be good for us uh, in that the, these are the Highway 17, but I'd like to, if we do write a letter to the legislators, uh, to do it for Santa Clara County too. Totally. And, uh, yeah. you know, or the whole region. And it, there's always this, um, uh, yeah. oh, just say in the public's mind and ours as well, confusion and tension between the state agencies and our electeds. Yeah. Right. And, you know, we elect the state electeds to represent our interests and often they have to make their um, preferences known to the state agencies as well. No one knows their goose on that. So um, I would just say this is going to be a big, complicated issue, so it's probably worth our while doing a briefing with the, the broader circle Agreed. of the state electeds. Um, another question kind of related to that is just a question to you whether or to what extent you think it's useful to outreach to uh, advocates in our community, um, particularly about uh, climate action. I mean, we have a really active climate action <laughs> community here, and you know, I think they're absent a deeper knowledge. Their instinct would be, yeah, go for those strict standards. Let's do it ASAP. But if <laughs> if they knew a little bit more, they might say, we understand the goal, the path. Etc. The complexities and support this direction, but um, sometimes the the simple ideal is easier to latch onto than <laughs> the path. So I, sure. I think if it's a matter of having support to CARB or to our state electeds, having just reaching out to some of these more active climate action green organizations in town could be useful. Agreed. I will tell you, at, at a statewide level, Sierra Club and the various environmental groups, uh, they haven't been real friendly to the proposals that the CTA has been talking about, and they have, they have taken a position to date of the sooner the better. Don't give them well, more time. Exactly to my The point. sooner the better. Yeah. Um, they haven't really focused on the parts of the ICT that still allow you to to buy diesel and CNG. And, and I think that's pretty obvious. We have to be able to continue to do that as we phase in the electrics. They've just been a little overly rigid on how soon it should be implemented, but then they don't operate buses. We do. This is a topic for further discussion, but I think it's worthwhile to engage the advocates who feel passionately about these issues. Um, and, and just a question, I would have to assume that the district's preference is not to have a huge number of different models, but 
chunks of model, just for maintenance and parts and all that other stuff. So, I mean, what I see us doing is getting, oh, you get two of these, and get, you know, three of these. That's complicating. And got, I have to assume down the line you want to get a dozen of something. Is that is that correct, or is that even possible? Well, no, it, it's 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 actually very correct, and. Uh, so our, our challenge is if we're buying a larger order, we go out for full-blown procurement. Mm -hmm. You know, you're subject to the competitive process and however that sorts itself out, it does. And you might get Proteria, you might get BYD, you might get New Flyer, who knows what you're gonna get. Um, we do, rarely will I say, it's, it, there's a little bit of an advantage in making small orders, but in the small order environment, we're able to, to look for contracts sometimes. And so for example, the, the funding that we, um, recently received uh, from the federal government, or they did the announcement the other day for the four, that'll fund four CNG buses. Um, what, what Aaron is working on is taking over some orders from Los Angeles County um, that Gilly was gonna provide buses for, and those would be buses that we would buy through that. So there's, there's opportunities to kind of target who your manufacturer is in that small purchase order that you don't have when you go to bigger purchase. Okay, well, those were all just questions. I mean, the recommendation stands good, on its good, own. Good it's points. Very good down. points. Director Rackham. First, first thing, uh, Cynthia, for her comments, I think it really is critical that we talk to our local community, aside from whatever's happening at the state level, about what we're doing, why we're doing it, what our choices are. I, I support the motion that's on the floor, although I would put a preface to it and actually put it in the wording so nobody sees that motion without the following attached to it. Given the district's uh, performance problems with the actually existing electric buses, and uh, given the incredible improvements in clean air quality of uh, diesel buses, the following is being supported by us. In other words, I think people need to understand why we're making this choice. If we could go out and buy an electric bus that worked, even if it was more, you know, a little more expensive, we would be doing that. That's just not an option for us. So I think we should make really clear why we're taking this action. I think we should probably set up actual meetings with local environmental yeah, groups yeah. and have board members want to go meet with them with staff think, who can talk, answer technical questions. I think too, and uh, I think we should write uh, something like this to each of the governing the three or four cities in the county. We have a commission on the environment that's really um, deep yes. into some of these. Mm -hmm. So they should. I think the governing agency should also be included in that. Thank you uh, for that yeah, suggestion. Yeah, and I'll incorporate Mike's um, language into my motion. Thank you. Director Rockwell. Uh, <clears throat> so I think we have a, a real communication challenge when you mention diesel. Yeah. I have mm -hmm. to tell you that I have prejudice against diesel, and it's been that way for years and years. I get so tired of sitting behind diesel mm -hmm. trucks and having to roll up my windows and turn on the air conditioner because I can't breathe. I mean, the stink is just horrible. In fact, just yesterday I was in Highway 1 with my wife, and I was behind a pickup truck that was diesel. And the smell was intolerable and we had to roll up our windows, but when you roll up the windows, all you're doing is trapping all that in the car. So when we say diesel and we say clean diesel, it sounds very much like clean coal, <laughs> I think to a large part of the community is that, is this really environmentally um, cognizant of what we're trying to accomplish? So I think we have a big challenge in terms of trying to sell diesel, because just the word diesel, I think to a lot of people means pollution. So I think that's one of the challenges. The other um, quite a, one question I have is, what is the comparison in terms of the cost of the fuel per mile for diesel as opposed to other fuels that we're using? Is it more expensive, is it the same, or is it less expensive? So I mean, we talked about maintenance being less, but what about the cost in terms of the fuel per oh, mile? Property cost. So the operating that? cost, I think, is an issue. So, with respect to the cost, yeah. you need to understand that, uh, of course, natural gas is a little less expensive than uh, diesel fuel. We're talking about a dollar eighty-three, dollar ninety uh, per gallon equivalent uh, versus diesel, which is about I think it's in around the range about three dollars right now, two eighty-five, three dollars. The problem is that you need twice as much compressed natural gas to get the same. Of energy that you do from diesel, so it's a wash, essentially. Okay, where the where the cost savings come in with diesel is basically the maintenance aspect of it. It's uh, 
it's less of a, a problem for us uh, running the diesel. We've got 1998 buses that have been running, and they're diesel, and um, they're pretty much working pretty well. Uh, if you keep them maintained and you pull them all at the periodic rate. Uh, whereas the CNGs, we've just had to do quite a bit more uh, of the repair aspects and overhauls than you would with the diesel. So you're getting twice the longevity, per se. Okay. Um, I guess a, a term that could be used rather than referring to clean diesel would be low emission diesel. And that's essentially a statement of fact. That's what it is. It's not, none of the, none of the engines uh, and the propulsion CNG and or diesel are clean, but they're low emission, right? And that's basically what we were trying to get to from when we started uh, into the CNG path. And uh, we achieved it, but the development and the technology that we now have with low emission diesels is equivalent almost. And I'm almost positive that the next series of diesel, low emission diesels coming out that would be under the orders that we would place uh, is cleaner than what we have now. And they're already car certified is not what we have now. So in this case, uh, what, we, what we would be able to buy is even clean. Um, they still going to stay. Well, <laughs> I, I was listening to what you were saying and, and having been a mechanic for 20 some odd years, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> not very really helpful. I mean, I'm sorry. It's, 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 so you got a high <laughs> off of it? Well, <laughs> honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed with the clean, uh, with the low emission diesels because they're not, they don't smell as <laughs> But that's just my own yeah, opinion. Right, so. Okay. Whatever we're doing. Exactly. It's our freshness. I guess it's better than nothing to do. Uh, uh, I hope that answers you. Vice Chair yeah. uh, Chase, then do yeah, you. Uh, Sarah, would you remind us what our options are for fueling stations? Because I know we've had some challenges related to the type of fuel and where we can fuel within the county. So it, what, how does that factor into our decision in terms of locations and access and things like that for each type of fuel? The, the, well, the compressed natural gas, clearly we have a, a full facility that uh, takes in the liquid, uh, liquid natural gas and compresses it into compressed natural gas, and that's what we've been using. The facility also has a, a large tank, a diesel tank. We were going to take it out, but we didn't. So it's still there, it's still operational. And our fallback is basically Flyers, which is on Ensel Street, that we need to utilize their facilities, and we still have access to their, their facility. So from a localized standpoint, it's pretty accessible in, in all respects. Great, thank you. Director Dutra. Thank you. <clears throat> So I have to agree with Director Rumpel. I mean, when I, I the, 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 being behind this vehicle is just it's always so irritating you have to roll up your windows and the smell. And I mean, even though it may smell good to you, it's super unhealthy. So that's <laughs> <laughs> kind of odd. But um, we uh, in Watson have this thing. We we have biodiesel, and for some reason, I, when I hear diesel, I'm like, oh, diesel. But when I hear biodiesel, it's really changed kind of the way I look at. It. I I actually don't think twice. I'm like. Biodiesel that must be that must be good, you know, and it must be green. And and when you, I mean, because we have biodiesel in Wattsville, maybe we're a little bit more, um, you know, we've been dealing with these kind of issues a lot longer than the rest of the Santa Cruz, but um, has. But you know, biodiesel is made out of animal fats and and, and, and plant plants and um, you know reused grease and, and things that are like you know coming basically that are recycled. You know, they're not. So um, I, I don't know. If this is how this diesel is made, if this is the same way as biodiesel is made, or if we are using biodiesel and you guys are trying to figure out a word what to call it when it's already called biodiesel, I, I'm not sure. I mean, usually it's what they call it a low sulfur diesel uh, versus what used to be used, which was high sulfur. The biodiesel is just more of an organic component that you can use. And I don't know if you've ever, ever seen trucks collecting uh, the grease from the restaurants and things of that nature. They convert it into, into a, a combustible liquid. Can we use biodiesel and then just call it a day? I mean... Well, it's, it's more expensive and I think that uh, what, what's happening is you want to use what the manufacturers recommend because you have an after-treatment aspect to the buses. 
and you want to make sure that the fuel that you're using is compatible with the after treatment that you're going to do. That's what gives you the low emissions. Well, you have a biodiesel plant in Watsonville, which would be super close. So, I mean, that's what I'm saying is like when it comes to cost, I think that would be cut down a lot if you used maybe some local suppliers um, that are already, you know, creating low emission diesel. Right. Right. I mean, that's something to look into. Uh, I, I don't know what the manufacturer would say. I mean, but because uh, we, we wouldn't want to void out any warranty or anything like that using something that's outside their realm. But right, well, that's something some, we should look into. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So, yes, I agree. Alex, is that okay? Yeah, no, we'll, we'll definitely look into it. I, I have the same concern that, that Sarah just expressed about the warranties, but if the manufacturer says it works, you know, we'll bring it back to it. And I mean, and then you're going to really cut back on having a community up in arms being you're bringing back diesel and you're like, it's biodiesel, it's plants, it's yeah. animal fat. <coughs> you know, we're recycling old grease. We'll check into this. Um, comments from the public? Uh, Dan Stevenson, I'm a Metro employee. Um, I just want to applaud uh, the board members that are considering uh, diesel as an option. I actually presented a uh, pretty good documentary on the topic of biodiesel back in 2013 or something when I was getting my 15-year uh, award. And um, I don't know if anybody read it. I have more copies. But I think it would be high time to get better educated on, on the issue of diesel. I was not aware, I had brought up the issue of biodiesel before and was told by certain people on the board that CARB would not allow for diesel in California. Now I'm hearing that in some cases they are. Anyway, I really, really think that there's a lot of misinformation about diesel, particularly the kind of stuff you're talking about, and I'd be happy to meet with you uh, later and give you a copy in person of the, uh, of the documentary. There are a whole other states that are highly dependent on, on and school districts that are 100% using biodiesel in this country. Biodiesel can be 100% emission free, it can be cleaner than electric. And let me just speak to a little bit about the electric thing. There's the, the electric thing is heading towards a monopoly type of economy like, uh, like some other things that have not gone well for our transportation infrastructure and I'm concerned about that. If we start to incorporate other forms of um, technology like biodiesel, we will avoid that problem. When you have a, a monopoly type of economy, you have uh, a dependency on that. We're seeing that with cell phones now. There's a lot of information regarding cell phones that are being suppressed because nobody can afford to be without a cell phone now because we're 100% we're dependent on them. And I don't want to see that happen with our, our transit infrastructure. I really support diversity in our fleet, and I think that that's something now that we have an opportunity with CARB and, and with the board. Uh, thank you, Jimmy, uh, being aware. There's other, there's other people in Watsonville that are producing alcohol-based fuels that are uh, essentially a type of biodiesel that are 100%. We have the capability in this county of leading the country on this because of what we have in Watsonville. We should be taking advantage of that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the public who would like to speak to us on this? Uh, bring it back to the board, uh, Director Rock. Just a, a couple of comments. Um, first, in response to Dan, that up until 2015, CARB had ruled out the possibility of buying a diesel, uh, a uh, uh, green diesel um, fuel, but that's not changed in 2015. So you weren't giving this information, just the reality changed in 2015 when those regulations ran out. The, um, uh, I don't know, I, you don't like riding behind diesel, I don't either, but I also don't much look like riding down the road behind McDonald's and, you know, uh, fries, uh, <laughs> leftovers or whatever it is that they actually run this stuff on. And you can smell that out of when you have the, uh, that, the uh, green diesel uh, alternative. The, I think people need to keep in mind the following as we have this discussion, and, and I, I appreciate all the, I'm not trying to, disagree with any of the comments that were made, but if we don't find a way to get buses in the interim, not the goal of 2040, but like over the next couple decades and actually buy enough buses to keep service on the road, the alternative is either people can't get where they need to go if they're transit dependent or they get back in their cars and that's the worst of all the options we have here because they're not likely to get back into a Prius or, you know, or a Leaf or something. They're going to get back into a 
car, whatever, whatever drives that car, it's going to, and there are going to be a lot of those cars and buses. Even the, uh, the old diesel buses do better than if all those people, if all those 40 people in the bus or 60 people, if they're standing, would have been all driving individual cars, it would be a lot worse for the environment. So really keeping the eye on what we're trying to do here, which is make public transit work for people. This is kind of a critical transition period for us. And I'm open to all of these options people have been talking about. But, but I, I don't think we can afford to just go, well, you know, we'd rather have all electric. We have all electric, then all we're going to have is people going back in cars or not getting somewhere for the interim. Uh, Director Kaufman Gomez. Good. Didn't happen again. Yeah, you're okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm also looking at it as a cost effective. It was a million dollars for electric. It was about 700 and um, some change for um, the, the biodiesel option. And then your um, your regular diesel being with about 575 or so. Um, if the CNG is twice the amount of money mechanically to um, take care of maintenance, even if you're buying it at a cheaper price point, your overall cost of maintenance is going to exceed the investment you'd need in something that is the uh, more efficient uh, biodiesel option um, as the technology is improved. Um, I won't, my husband won't get electric right now because he knows of the toxic waste even the electric component has in terms of the battery storage. Um, so that's one reason why I don't have one of those, although I'm looking at being as efficient as possible. Um, so I think it becomes a win-win situation to, to be able to make sure that we advocate this as a good option because technology is far exceeded where we're at. Um, we, we know that our standards in California are much higher than uh, throughout the nation. And uh, we, we do have the entrepreneurship in this county that I think could benefit us if we can make sure we get past the fine line of what the warranty reads um, in the vehicles that uh, I think would be much more cost effective with the longevity for the investment. Yes, uh, Director Matthews. I, I think, you know, fundamentally, fundamentally what we're talking is about is our desire to um, uh, maintain a, a reliable, cost-efficient service that reflects our evolving knowledge of environmentally sound technology. That's, uh, that's, so I'd like to kind of tweak that that's opening fine. statement because I think that's what we're getting at. <coughs> We've seen it evolve a lot and it will continue to. Okay. Right. any other questions? We have a motion and a second on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Uh, we will go to item number 15, uh, consideration of appointment of Jason Lopez to the Metro Advisory Committee, or MAC, for a term of office ending in December 31st, 2021. And I would like to say, as a member of the MAC Advisory Committee, and I welcome any of the other committee members to comment on this, we had a, a tremendous application pool in this. Uh, it was really impressive and I'm sorry we couldn't have appointed each of them because they were uh, well qualified. But uh, Mr. Lopez is a regular writer of Highway 17. He does. He and his wife do not own vehicles, uh, cars. Uh, he goes over the hill four or five times a day. So uh, and uh, it really feels a, in that respect a good void on the MAC committee. But uh, if any other of the MAC committee members would like to uh, comment. I thought one of the cute comments was the fact that he said, well, you get two for the price of one because my wife is doing the same thing. <laughs> and she will be putting in her comments through me toward Mac and the Metro system. Okay, move yeah. approval yeah. of the recommendation. Second. Again, uh, uh, motion and a second for move approval. Maybe we should have any comments from the public that uh, they might want to I just want to let you know that we had a great pool of applicants. Uh, I want to repeat that. Uh, and we encourage those who were interested to maintain their interest in Metro. Uh, we have a motion to second. Yes? Uh, just a question. Is there, can people electronically sign up to be on a mailing list, an email list? So those members who applied and were not uh, uh, chosen, can they just request being getting the agenda so they can participate? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a sign on the website that you can do. Yeah, well, when you make the notifications, you might invite them to do that. Okay, yeah. very good, very well. Okay, you and another comment? I, I just wanted to make sure that uh, those applicants uh, that were received that were being not, um, not, um, voted on today to continue to apply because we yeah. will have yeah. an evolution of new openings um, as it cycles through. 
So we still encourage you to come back and, um, and participate and, and keep, keep up to speed with what we're doing, and especially on that committee and the impact that that committee will have on, on the decision making board here. Okay. A motion and a second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried unanimously. We'll now go to um, our monthly financial report, Angela Aiken. Good morning. Who is now chair of the uh, County Treasury Advisory Oversight Committee. Wow. Keep our money safe somehow. There you go. Okay, so this is for uh, ending the month of February 28th. For the month of February, we ended with uh, about a million dollars in favorable um, operating money. Operating revenue for about um, $640,000 to the good, and our expenses were about $325,000. Year to date, we're 67% um, through the year, about a million five in revenues, um, and about a million four in operating expenses. with the budget versus the actuals. I'll go to the page that should there. There we go. There's the variances for the revenues. So on the uh, cost of repairs, you know that our ridership is a little bit down from what we had budgeted. Our sales tax is up. We have um, budgeted 2.5%. We brought in about 4.5% of all last year. So that's where the almost million dollars in sales tax is coming. That's a combination of the Measure D money and the uh, regular sales tax that we've been getting for a few years. The as in interest, sorry, just a quick question. How does that line break down between those two sources? Or maybe you're going to cover it somewhere else. No problem. You want to the details? See here. I did not bring that. I don't have that, not, that detail. It's not critical. I'm just curious. curious. Yeah. Okay. Both sales tax. We budgeted both sales tax at 2.5% uh, increase, and so um, sales tax is sales tax. They're both going up uh, about 4.5%. So let me see here. Hold on. Okay, $906,000 is our 1979 sales tax we've been getting, and about $70,000 is the Measure D money that we're getting above the budget that we put forward. All right, uh, other operating assistance, that's the UCSC Arctic bus contract that we had. We did not have that budgeted. That was a new contract that we entered into this year. And then the uh, STA, STA we should be receiving around $3.4 million, of which we're going to leave a million to an operating budget, and we're going to be transferring $2.2 million through the year to the capital budget to fund equipment and buses. So that $676,000 is going to be transferred to the uh, to the capital budget. We do not do that every month. We let it accumulate a little bit and we transfer it every few months. Any questions on the revenue? Moving on to the expenses. This is your um, budget versus actual expenses. Actual expenses are the purple. Budget is the gold. Almost all of them we are under budget, which is good. Here's the deltas. So the first three columns, the two blues and the one red, there's a box in the middle there. If you have those all together, it's a favorable variance. There's about $261,000 difference between the regular labor and the labor overtime. So we are a little um, um, over on our labor, but we are way under on fringe benefits. Um, as it says there in the box, that's due mainly because of the medical insurance premiums and a significant lower workers' comp than we anticipated. Services, that's professional and technical fees. There's contracts in there that we have not met yet, so those expenses have not been incurred. Materials, uh, mobile materials and supplies. Uh, we're starting to um, spend more revenue parts than was budgeted. Um, we've been talking almost constantly about how old our equipment and our buses are and how we have to continue continually repair them. So now you're starting to see where it's affecting the budget, where the money that we had in the budget is uh, beginning to not be enough for just that line item. And then other expenses, um, that's a settlement cost. Uh, we always budget uh, a amount for settlement costs, hoping that we don't 
funded, and so far we have been under budget on spending so far. Any more questions on the expense side? Moving on to capital. This is the capital budget. Um, this is our funding slide. This is the type of funding that we have for all of our different capital projects. We have a budget of about $20 million, of which we've spent $2.2 million. The next slide shows you what we spent that on. So this is the expense side of the capital. Um, if you want to see the detail to this slide, go to 16B1. That shows you the detail to the construction-related projects, the IT projects, the revenue vehicles that we bought, and the non-revenue vehicles that we bought. Any questions on the budget? Okay. Director Kaufman Gomez. Yes, thank you. Um, slide 16A6 that's in our packet. Um, we have the labor, labor overtime, the fringe benefits, the services. Are you finding the fringe? Is this where our calculus um, expenses are, are coming out of? The retirement, yes. Okay. Can we have that broken down? Because CalPERS is a huge hit for our agency, and I, I believe that it would be good for us to actually show that as, as how much of that impact we have of our overall budget. Um, it's significant, and I want to make sure that we show that. Okay. Director Matthews. And uh, heavy on our mind is what's our predictable this year contribution to CalPERS and what's our payback for the long term? Yeah, those are two different things. Yeah. And as um, good questions. I haven't heard it from this agency, but what's the projection of the hits going forward? Uh, that's a good question. And, uh, I, I, how, how would you? I didn't hear what you said. Sorry. Oh, um, in terms of the CalPERS um, uh, payments. What are the payments for this year, and what are the assessments for payback for the debt? Would you like to have that go out, like, say, three years or a couple of years? Three, five, whatever. I mean, I know that's <laughs> yeah, that's, that's heavy on our mind, right? Well, now. same with the county. Yeah. Um, can do we do that? Uh, let's say, say a, a two or three year projection at least, anyway. So in the current budget, we pay as we go. That's that's what's in our budget. We, we pay as we go. So as the expenses are incurred, we know what we are. Uh, supposed to be paying to make ourselves solvent for this year, so we pay as we go in the current operating budget. We have unfunded liability. Yes, that's a completely different number. That's not in your operating budget at all. That is something that takes into account every single person that's ever worked here and has ever retired here and is still, not to be morbid, but still alive. Yeah, yeah. And so we, uh, we um, have an actuary that comes through, I believe, every other year, every three years. And they put together an actuarial for us. And then we keep track of what those um, future costs are going to be. So that's why it's um, um, not in our current budget. So I believe what you're asking me for is you would like something that tells you what are those current expenses that we put into the operating budget. And then as a completely separate thing, you want to know what the unfunded liability would be. Two separate things. Is that correct? Yes. And is this agency not getting the... Um, uh, assessments from CalPERS to make up their current debt. We do so not do anything like that. No, we are not. We have not incurred a bond or a loan or anything like that to pay um, our unfunded liability down. Um, one of the things that I like to talk to you guys um, in previous meetings is that we have a sales tax that is into perpetuity. It's not mm -hmm. like we have to continually go out and find new money to fund. Um, or some of our ongoing expenses. Um, if that was the case, I'd probably be laying on the floor right now. But because we have kind of that constant out there, we know we're going to have money to fund things in the future. If something happened to this agency, we would still have that sales tax coming in to fund future costs because we would still be an entity that owed. Um, I'll be interested in pursuing the offline. Okay. The differences between what I pursue and how we're handling. Sure. No problem. Just a minute. Uh, Mr. Clifford. Yes, yeah, so Mr. Chair, look, let me just suggest that we place on an upcoming agenda a uh, board report on this. Uh, we met very recently in orientation with our new board member, Trent Kaufman, 
uh, it raised a lot of questions about PERS that we're researching. Uh, and as soon as all of that information comes together, I think it would be beneficial to share with everybody. Uh, and it's some of those same questions about the unfunded uh, liability, our portion of the unfunded liability, what portion of payback is included in what PERS mandates for us on an annual basis. Let, let us collect all that information together. We, I think it would also be helpful for us to include in that report some additional information about what others are doing. Yeah. The county, the cities in this county, and maybe what other transit properties are doing, because we're not alone in that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think we so have that by next month or June? Or? I think May might be too quick, but yeah. if we can tentatively put it on for June, that would be my goal. Okay, that's what we Director Rockin. Um, <clears throat> When, when we're gathering this information, uh, the um, CalPERS is going to like basically change our rates <coughs> to answer one of the questions yeah. asked here yeah. in, ne in next yes. year, the year following, and so yeah. forth. So there'll be there'll be guesses or predictions about what they're going to set them at, but we don't necessarily know what those are. That's a different question than the so-called unfunded liability issue, in which I'm sorry, but a you know very conservative. Uh, view is that we should somehow have in our bank enough money to pay off every uh, retirement of every member that works here for the rest and their beneficiaries for all time, which is absurd because no agency could do that. And it's sort of, you run around going like, oh my God, they've got this huge pit they're all going to fall into. Well, no, we're not going to fall into that. Money is raised in the future to pay those those costs. So I'm very interested in the question of what we think our fee our CalPERS responsibilities are going to be in the next, not just this next, this year, but say three years out as was being suggested yes, here, yes, but yes. not, I'm, I don't care what that number is of like what it would cost us if we closed tomorrow and had to pay off everybody's pension, which there are people out there arguing you should be doing, often using that figure to show we're billions, you know, billions in debt and we'll never get out of the hole. And it's Walters. just ridiculous. Dan Walters, that's what I was talking about. Any other questions from the board? Are, are you through with the, nope. your your gut? Okay, keep going. Keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> so the additional information that I put forward to you is here. Let's see, all right. Our unemployment rate a year ago was 8.5. Today it's 6.7. Our gas was down to two dollars and ninety-one cents a year ago, February. Now it was up to 3.43. And our monthly ridership um, looks like we're a little higher than last year for fixed route, and uh, we're about the same for Cabrillo, but we're a little higher for Chavi 17. So it just kind of gives you a 12 month look see forward. Excuse me, I, I, um, on the earlier, I saw the passenger fares was down. Was that just because of the consolidation of, of services that we've had, uh, we've put in place? and. Uh, the passenger fare revenues were down. But so this is actual to actual. What I told you before is budget to actual. Two, two different numbers. Any other questions? Right, moving on to the next one. So the preliminary March data um, on the expense side only, we're looking at about uh, $2.5 million that we should be on the positive side of our expenses. We've had quite a few open uh, impositions. That's where some of the overtime comes in. Uh, significant savings and fringe benefits, and then we are uh, not spending everything that we have budgeted in the non-personal expenses. So it's looking good so far. But that's just our preliminary numbers. I do not have the revenue side of March yet. You will see that next month. And then going on to the non-controllable budget risk. This is something that I will bring back to you probably through November when the uh, potential ballot measure comes through. We have the SB1 situation. Today it is worth $2.2 million to us. Uh, million two in operating and about $985,000 in the capital side. If that uh, repeal is passed in November, we will lose $2.7 million going into 2019. So that's a significant amount of money. Uh, million seven, almost a million eight in operating, and then again around a million dollars in the capital. Any other questions from uh, board members? Uh, Director Matthews. Not yet officially 
That would be on the November ballot, of course, yeah, but yeah. Uh, no, not it hasn't yet. But it's moving yeah, on anticipated quite Anticipated that it will. Yeah. yeah. I just want to addition uh, uh, the significance that we need to really keep this on the, the front of the burner um, about keeping the SV1. When the November ballot comes out, we will likely see gas prices probably closer to four. Mm -hmm. And people are going to look at that gas tank at four dollars a gallon and what SB1 is costing. And they may be making their decision off of that. And we have to really emphasize every penny and how it's been spent resourcefully on anything that SB1 is paid for. So whatever we need to do to market that, to send that message out to those voters when they vote in November on whether they decide to make sure that, that bus is on the road or whether their gas price goes down by whatever it's going to go down by if it were to be repealed and having those the, the ruts and the holes and deferred maintenance. It's going to be significant that we all contribute to market to, to say this SB1. I, I just uh, remember the Executive Committee of the California State Association of Counties, I know we're very sensitive to that, and uh, I know the League of California Cities is as well. Um, we just uh, voted recently on our Measure D e, um, uh, project list, and um, I brought up in that uh, context, but also on SB1. I think at every opportunity that we can say, this project brought to you by SB1, this service mm -hmm. brought to you by, that's a fact, it's not telling you how to vote, but um, to your point, I think people really have to see, oh, the, these revenues are delivering these services, and those signs, every, every time there's a project or a service, that should be perfect. Yeah. Need pictures of burning buses. <laughs> yeah. Burning buses. Big yes. billboards with yeah. burning buses. Yeah. Any other comments from the board? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Hager. Alex, isn't the marketing agent going to be doing some of this? Yeah. Well, if if we get one, yes. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was my better. next point. Currently, we better get some. Currently, uh, we we have uh, uh, various managers who come together as a team to help us with some marketing efforts. Uh, we we are going to do a, a SB1 oriented media event there last half of May is what we're targeting right now and we would show off the uh, um, three cutaways that we received and the three Paul Revere's that we're leasing and show that as uh, SB1 funded vehicles we just received this week the stickers from CTA that we'll place on there on those buses so when those buses are going down the street, there'll be stickers saying this was funded by SB1. Oh, yeah, exactly. yeah. I think we need to do that in every city and the county where we're doing Absolutely. a project. Absolutely, and um, uh, maybe if we could all ask RTC, I mean, they're the logical one to be developing some kind of a coordinated look and feel for that campaign. Good, yeah. good point. Yes, Director okay. Lind. The uh, city of Scotts Valley just received, or we just got notified that uh, this has been awarded a, a million dollar grant from SB1 local partnership uh, funds. Um, and that'll be for Glenwood. For the high, it's, a, it's a real high, visually, uh, it'll be noticed, you know, from a high school on up to add a bike lane. And it's just been an area that's been very unsafe that we're always hearing about at every meeting. So that'll be an opportunity, you know, when that's announced to be able to. Do the same thing. Yeah, but I think, you know, like they do for interstates. I mean, put a big four bay yeah. sign. This, no, I'm serious. You know, it'll drive away all the time. Yeah. 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 Well, safety is a really, really important yeah. issue. Yeah. You emphasize the safety part. Of right. It. Yeah. So, you know, we can kind of, you know, cut expenses, but then also cut mm -hmm. safety. Kind of. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially okay. this is for, and uh, this particularly for kids and students at all, right? It's more, I think it hits home more to the residents there because they're not the children. Yeah. Yeah. I'm making a note. Okay. Any other questions? Are you done? <laughs> 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 I'm afraid to ask. Yeah. 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 Done with this report. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Might, <laughs> might ask if there's any comment. Uh, it's just a report. We're just going to file this. Or is there any comment from the, the public? Motion to accept. Oh. Second to motion. Oh, we have a motion to accept and a second. Uh, it's on the floor. Yes. Um, so just a comment on the on the pension front. Um, 
um, uh, we like to compare ourselves to uh, districts, not cities, because uh, it's, it's <coughs> interesting because your costs of the cities and the counties are a lot when you went with the sheriffs and the fire departments at a, mm -hmm. at a, at a, at a, a, a public safety. You, you went at a bigger ratio on them and were regular employees. So um, just to not not put ourselves in that bucket. Uh, okay. It's a different order, right? Yeah. Um, and just um, school, you know, um, just kinds of issues. Thank you. Um, any other comments from the public? Here we have a motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's ordered unanimously. Uh, moving right along to item number 17, accept and file a consideration of a resolution to adopt Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District's Equal Employment Opportunity Program effective January 1st, 2018 through 2000, December 31st, 2020. Good morning, Dr. Jolene Church, Jolene Human Church. Resource Manager. Um, this morning I'll be bringing to you our newly improved <laughs> Equal Employment Opportunity Program for 2018-2020. Why is a new and improved uh, FTA it released a circular in October 2016, which greatly changed the layout and the information that's provided in this document. Of course, as an agency, it's always our goal to attract, retain, and develop highly skilled talent. We do that under the guise of equal employment opportunities. And so with that, um, it moves beyond just fair hiring and fair promotions. Um, effectively coaching in discipline and providing training opportunities and development for all. Uh, that is a part of this program. Uh, as you'll see, just flipping through um, the newly revised program, there is a new uh, Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District EEO policy statement, that's section two. This uh, new statement follows the new guidelines under FTA. This is the recommended template uh, for how the policy statement should look. This is something that uh, the board should um, become familiar with because this is a document uh, the board will be trained on. Uh, this will be posted on our website and will be a part of any uh, recruitment material. This uh, document is our guiding document for our EEO. Other significant changes uh, within the reporting are the reporting requirement on what's called the EEO-4, which not only breaks down um, the, the racial dynamics of our workforce, but also uh, provides reporting on disciplinary actions by work group, as well as uh, the training opportunities provided by work group. And all of these are broken down by uh, sex and by race. And so those are those are new things that you um, have not seen in the past in an EEO report and in an EEO program, but they are requirements of the FGA. So this uh, new program is um, put together in a way where there's uh, significant monitoring and controls in place, reporting that's in place. Um, much of that reporting will take place uh, between the executive level staff, the senior level staff, uh, and myself with uh, the CEO, uh, making sure that we're staying on track, staying on target. We'll bring that information to, to the board and periodically update you uh, how we are uh, on our hiring uh, goals. Um, in no way would we set a quota based on race or sex. But what we do find from the templates provided from FTA in running our underutilization reports is that we may have a significant um, opportunity with different groups of people that we may want to target our recruiting efforts um, in those areas that we may not have reached in the past. Uh, for example, if we had a, a lower uh, representation in a certain um, gender or, or specific uh, race associated with that gender, we may reach out to various um, business networks, um, different student groups, uh, different other employment networks so that we can specially target those, those um, plans. And so we put this program forward to you for your consideration and um, we ask that you um, approve the resolution adopting Metro's Equal Employment Opportunity Program for January 1st, 2018 through December 31st, 2020. Any questions? 
If anybody thinks Exhibit A is one or two pages, uh, go through about 121 of them, right? and you'll get there. So it's, uh, yeah. it's very thorough, and uh, thank you for it. Well, well done. Uh, Director Duker? Mm -hmm. uh, just a quick question. What do you have in here that directly, um, you know, I guess addresses the LGBTQ community when it comes to um, uh, work? That's actually a really interesting question because it's not a specifically designated category under EEO. However, of course, it's it's always um, of utmost important to make sure that you're representing the diverse uh, community that you serve. And so anytime we're out targeting our recruitment efforts, um, first off, we go through the schools, we go through any of the, um, the training uh, uh, portals through available through our local universities and campuses, and then through our um, EDD and any of any of our our typical uh, resources where we would have placement, and we want to make sure that because those the those community members are going to be a part of of those um, other placement groups, and so we target those first, and then we reach out and network. Uh, becoming a part of various groups, and that really, as the new uh, human resource manager, will be one of my goals this year, is really doing a lot of networking and getting involved in the community with different groups um, that may not have been um, really approached in the past to become just, uh, you know, a, a good part of the community and just, and really learning to be a part of the community. Um, so, so identifying those groups. So though they may not specifically be addressed, they um, they would definitely uh, be targeted within our our direct our uh, targeted placement. I appreciate that, and I appreciate you you know getting more involved with uh, you know there's places like the diversity center, and you know I mean there is a really large LGBTQ community that reside in this county. So um, I think creating better relationships with um, you know that group as well as other groups is is I think really important for our organization. Right. Thank you, Thank you Vice Chair Chase. Thank you for the presentation and all the detail in here. So when it's talking about in the first page, the bullets of the goals for hiring for various different job groups, is that as our own internal policy that has dictated our goals there, or is that because of the federal uh, Yes, let me, let me point out. Um, you can flip to, say, page 18 of the EEOP, the proposed EEOP. Table 5.2 will show you a utilization analysis by job code. This is a standard template provided by FTA. We plug in our actual numbers for our last three years reporting period. And out of that, uh, the algorithm provides us with areas of potential adverse impact. That does not mean that, that adverse impact actually exists, but it is um, an indicator that we may have an underutilization in that area. And so as you can see, under the very first category, uh, where it says officials, that's officials and administrators, uh, it shows percent underutilization, 3%, underutilized, yes, no, yes, N number needed to reach one. And so this specific area actually shows one Asian male is needed to, to um, reach parity. Um, how is that determined? Well, the local available workforce is, is evaluated. So we look at the state workforce, how many Asian males are in the state of California. And then our typical hiring area, which for us is typically Monterey County and Santa Cruz County. So with that, what is our Asian male population? We take that from the 2010 US Census. And so with all that data in the algorithm, that's how this spits out. So the goal specifically comes from FTA's formula and then how we, um, the actions tied to that goal, how are we gonna reach that, that one Asian male? Well, we're going to, we're going to target uh, more more populations where those Asian males may be in our recruitment activities. Now, does that mean we're going to hire an Asian male only? No, it means that we're going to make sure that we reach more Asian males so that with with uh, any of our recruitment material. And you know, it, it's one of those uh, numbers. Uh, maybe we'll have more Asian males uh, apply. And in the past, um, using this type of algorithm and making sure that 
when you're watching something and when you know what to target, you can you can more easily attract that. But if you if you don't, you just randomly post things as you always have. You you don't get the results that you want or reach your goals. So so we've definitely come up with some um, targeted plans based on the underutilization report. I think sometimes it's hard for the general public to understand too when you think of proportionality and you think just let's look at gender. And so reasonably thinking you'd want it roughly 50%, right? And so I think understanding the, the metrics and, and what is feeding into those decisions is important so that people can better wrap their brains around sort of why the hiring looks this way and why the recommendations are for very specific things. Um, it is a minimum standard though. So I mean, I, I guess from my perspective is I think that the more diversity that we have and the more representative we can actually be of this community, kind of to um, Jimmy's point is, I think important to us is a value of this board and of this community is to, to certainly strive to meet these goals and exceed those because it's a minimum federal standard. Right. Director Matthews? Yeah. Um, you answered some questions about the um, extent of difference in this forum from previous mm -hmm. ones and it's, it's long. <laughs> and I understand the um, metrics driving the algorithms and all, all that, but that one page just leapt out at me reading it. It seems so formula driven and frankly weird. One Asian male is needed. Is there any other way to say it? It just, you know, and in this category, three women and one Hispanic male are needed. It just, it, is there I, any under, way I understand. That? Well, it's interesting because the FTA specifically wants to so wants to understand needed. the underutilization. Yes, because um, how many are needed to reach parity is their specific language, and so we meet we match their language. and And it was interesting putting the document together because FTA actually has a checklist to put this together, and we we mirrored their language throughout. Uh, just to make the reviewing of the document by the FTA easier. And so we did mirror their language, but I hear what you're saying, and um, it's something of note that is not mentioned here uh, that that would be um, to really to, to be proud of is that um, to see the underutilization numbers that we do have in, in the various areas, um, we have very little underutilization, and you'll see just these a few a few groups that um, we'd like to target and better um, point some of our, our recruiting towards. However, um, we have a very diverse workforce, and that's something to be very proud of. Something that that Metro can embrace is that uh, it does have a history here, looking back through the past EEOPs, that we have um, consistently had a very diverse workforce, and that's something to be proud of. Whether it says we need one Asian male <laughs> or not, um, it, it is something to be very proud of. But this does point out specific groups that um, that we may want to to look at a little a little better. I obviously understand that you got to do what you got to do, um, and I didn't uh, look carefully to see. Maybe it's here already, but just something more of a philosophical statement, kind of along the line of what Cynthia Chase has suggested. This reads so bureaucratic to yeah. the point of being almost offensive. And I think to the extent we do um, reach for diversity in our workforce, um, to the extent we make gains and maintain that commitment, that that should be reflected somewhere rather than just running the formulas. So Absolutely. I, I, I hear you on that. I, and I think that all of our, all of our uh, recruitment outreach and, and any of our external customer facing and even internal customers um, to our own, our own staff, uh, that message is softer and less bureaucratic because we do care. And, and attracting and retaining and developing are amazing goals to have. Um, however, if you forget that people are people, that then you lose something there. So I hear what you're saying. Anyway, just a comment, yes. if it can be incorporated, fine. And I do think the uh, greater emphasis on training does, over time, contribute to building a more diverse world. Mr. Clifford? Just quick clarification. Uh, 
in the way of a plea from your CEO, we are late in submitting this to the FDA. I, I read that, yeah. So not if, if, I, if I could move forward with sure. this and take these comments as uh, guidance for the next version, would that be acceptable? Uh, yeah, we, we really are late in getting this to yeah. the FDA. I was just going to ask that if we don't have a, a value statement that this could actually be mm -hmm. referred to the HR personnel committee, perhaps it's the appropriate committee yeah. for that to develop one. And this could certainly go forward, and then we could take that on as a charge of that committee to develop a one for the for the um, for the district. Mm -hmm. Very good. Director Rocket. I, I would just point out that this district is actually does amazingly well in terms of diversity issues. Um, it wasn't always that way. Um, I can remember when there was concern about hiring female bus drivers. You know, and we were way beyond that, and. Um, People driving around Watsonville were all white, and that was a problem and stuff. And we took that issue on. And so in the end, people are raising concerns about the way this is reported out. But the reality is that the workforce in this agency actually is diverse and reflects the diversity of our community. We're not a completely diverse community in the way that we might be, but we, or this agency is at least as diverse as the community is, and that's what I think is really kind of critical. Any other questions? Uh, questions from the public? Any input? I just want to echo my, uh, Director Rockin's comments. Uh, we have a very diverse um, workforce, and we try to, um, in our hiring practice, uh, keep because one of the things that we're not getting enough of is, is you know, oper operators and, and these positions. Um, and you know, we've enticed, but um, we've gone to the, um, um, you know, not the. Um, to the farmers markets just to get the word out and trying to get you know motivate females um, to um, apply and um, sometimes without success because you know the transformative atmosphere now um, back in the 70s and 80s was a bit like I'm going to do you know a man's job you know kind of thing I'm going to get on and do a uh, and now it's uh, that's kind of way people we want a more stable and because of our shifts and people uh, um, having families, it's hard uh, and it's hard to attract because of the shifts because we you know function almost 24/7. So it's it's uh, that's one of the biggest challenges. And in on current status, the unemployment rate is really uh, attractive everywhere. Everybody's trying to hire, so we've been having some challenges in attracting that kind of thing. So, thank you. Any other comments from the public? Okay, well, uh, bring this back for a for acceptance. Uh, did we have? Did we accept the report? Uh, a motion by Rockin, second by Matthews. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered, unanimously. And, and maybe we can just add to that the um, the direction here. The direction to refer yeah. the issue of evaluation. That was certainly part of my motion. Everybody understood that. <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll announce that the uh, next meeting of the Metro Board is Friday, May 18th at 9 a.m. at the Watsonville City Council Chamber. And after nearly, well, yeah, two hours of uh, trying to get through this short agenda, because we didn't